Hello, I am going to talk to you about advanced threat detection today. This is a new suite of features that Fusion Auth released in version 1.30, and it's available to all customers who are on the Enterprise Edition. So if you're not an Enterprise Edition customer of Fusion Auth, you can watch this video and see what you're missing. This suite of features enables a large number of security protections. If you are on an enterprise plan and you upgrade to 1.30, you still need to reach out to Fusion Auth. At the time these videos are being recorded, we're doing a soft launch, and so we want to make sure everyone has a good experience. So you actually need to reach out to us and we will enable advanced threat detection for your account. The final thing I want to say is that this is a robust set of functionality, but like everything else in Fusion Auth, we'll be continuing to improve it over time. So the first thing I want to show you is the dashboard. As part of advanced threat detection, you can see where people are logging in from. So you have this nice map. So the next thing I want to show you is the reactor page. So the reactor page is how you can confirm that you have advanced threat detection enabled. Over here, we can see a list of all of the features in Fusion Auth that are part of the paid editions. And at the bottom, you can see threat detection. So that says inactive, and you are on an enterprise account. Please open a support ticket and request that advanced threat detection be turned on. Otherwise, you won't be able to use any of the features that this walkthrough is going to highlight. Next, we're going to look at access control lists. So an access control list is a set of rules that are available to allow or deny access from a given IPv4 address. Let's create one. So if to give it a name, let's say that we're setting up an access control list for the CEO's home computer. There are going to be certain applications that are only available from the CEO's IP address. We can give it a name. We can paste in an IP address. This IP address is a totally made up one. We can add multiple entries if we want, and you can add in as many as you want and they can be either allowed or blocked. In this particular case, we're going to simply add in one. All right, you can add multiple sets of IP rules here. Again, we're just gonna add one here. And this is not all that useful in and of itself, but we'll be able to use this as a building block in other pieces of the advanced threat detection system. One of those is API keys. So here we're going to add, here we're going to add an API key and we're going to limit it to a certain IP address. So in this particular case, the CEO might be able to run a script with a given API key and we want to limit that to only being run on the CEO's home computer. We set it to have this access control list. We can also limit it to certain endpoints, and that's always a good idea because this is a demo. I'm going to allow this to be a super key and not limit it to any endpoints. Now let's go ahead and get the API key and we'll demo how this works. I'm going to make a request against the Fusion Auth API and it will fail because I'm not at that IP address.
Now I forgot to make this verbose. So let's go ahead and make it verbose so we can actually see the status code. Let's see, it's a 401, we're denied. If we edit this, if we change it to run from any IP address, then this will succeed. So you can see that the ability to create an arbitrary IP address range or set of ranges and then associate that with an API key can be very useful if you want to secure your API key access. The next thing I want to talk about are webhooks. So here we're at the webhook screen and we're going to create an example webhook. And this looks very similar to the existing webhook screen, the pre 1.30 webhook screen. But here we have all these interesting events. And some of these are available in the community edition, but some are reserved for additions with the advanced threat detection feature. And those are items such as password update, password reset success, password reset start. There's a full list of these in the events and webhooks documentation. These webhooks are all events that a security team may want to know about. Probably not individual events, but they probably want to ingest them into an SIEM system or uh, have some other way of recording these, right? This could be useful just for auditing purposes. So you can see we have user password update right here that I could enable. And now if I enable that here and on the tenant, then this endpoint, example.com slash webhook, will receive information about whose passwords have been updated when. One thing that's worth noting with webhooks is that we will, if possible, retrieve the location information based on the IP address and pass that along to you. Uh, there's other things that we do with that location information as well, including logging and warning if there is impossible travel. Let's go ahead and take a look at the tenant configuration screen. So here you can see these same webhook event settings. In the webhook page we looked at previously, which was the, you went to settings and then webhooks, that's where we're setting up the endpoint and enabling certain webhooks to be sent at this instance. Now here we can further filter it and enable certain webhooks to be sent at the tenant by tenant basis. So if we go down and we look at the user.password.update, we can turn that on and now anytime a user updates a password in this tenant, that webhook that we previously defined will receive it. Prior to 1.30, all webhooks were transactional. That meant that you had this nice setting here, which you could configure at the tenant level and say, if all webhooks don't succeed, you need to fail this operation. Well, a lot of these new events, these security-based events are really informational, and so they're not gonna stop a user from updating their password. So therefore, we don't really care what your webhook returns. We're going to fire and forget. But you can ingest it, push it to whatever internal systems you need to push it to, and rest assured that FusionAuth will let you know whenever any interesting security events appear. I'm not going to go over each of these events. I think it's worthwhile for you to go to the documentation and see what events are available. The next thing we're going to look at is the email section. So let's look at the email section of the tenants. Here we have templates and you can see that there's a bunch of new templates that are for these advanced threat detection features. These roughly correspond to the webhooks 
that are defined that fire off information about security events, but instead of firing a webhook, these actually send emails to the user in question. So if a password is updated, you can send a message to the end user saying, hey, your password's been updated, and that'll happen automatically. As a reminder, all these templates benefit from FusionAuth's built-in localization. So if the user's preferred language is French and you've written a French template, then they will receive that message in, in French. The other thing I want to point out here is the uh, suspicious login feature. And so basically FusionAuth has built in some intelligence into the login process. If we see a login looks suspicious, we will send an email to that user. An example of how a login might look suspicious is an impossible travel situation where someone logs in with an IP that is in Germany and then an hour later logs in with an IP that is in the USA. That is possible because people could use a VPN, but it certainly is suspicious. And so we will fire off an email and we also provide location data in the email so you can actually say to your end user, hey, this login was in the USA, is this you? So these are, again, all email templates that are available to you with advanced threat detection. Now let's look at the security tab. Let's look at the security tab. There's a lot of additional configuration here. Let's go down the list. So first is the access control list settings. Similarly, how you can control access to an API key by IP address, you can also control access to the hosted login pages. So in this particular case, I could lock down every application in this tenant by the IP address. This probably isn't going to be useful if you only have one IP address, but it's possible you could have an IP address range for, for instance, your internal network and you might want FusionAuth to just deny all requests that didn't come from that internal network. So CAPTCHA is frankly those really annoying pictures that you sometimes get when you're signing up for things. Please select all the pictures with the car in them or something like that. The idea behind those, apart from being annoying, the idea behind those is to help prevent automated systems from accessing whatever page the CAPTCHA is protecting. And so that is now built into Fusion Auth. You can choose between a number of different CAPTCHAs. You're responsible for going out and getting the configuration information, but then Fusion Auth drops that CAPTCHA on a number of different pages. The login page, the registration page, the forgot password page, now, of course, you can control that because it is part of the theming system. So you can say, okay, I'm going to show the CAPTCHA only on the registration page, not on the login page. That's entirely up to you. But this just provides an additional level of security, making sure that only human beings are taking whatever privilege actions you want to protect. Next thing to look at is the block domain settings. So I think this is a really interesting feature. FusionAuth has the ability for you to declare an application to have self-service registration. That means anybody can register for that application and they get access to uh, that application. They're basically in the parlance of FusionAuth, they're registered for the application. What this lets you do is put in certain email domains like gmail.com or example.com or fusionauth.io and you can then prevent anyone with that domain from registering for an application. If I put in something like gmail.com or yahoo.com and I save this, all applications that have self-service registration available would deny access to anybody who tried to register with a gmail.com or yahoo.com address. Why might you do this? 
well, it's possible that you are building an application that is only for business users. And so you do want to disable or prevent people from registering with personal accounts. Another option would be to put in your business domain name. And what that would do with that is that would prevent employees of your business from registering for this application with their business email address. So that's block domain settings. Finally, there are rate limit settings. And this is a kind of a really powerful thing that, again, you might be able to do this via a um, network proxy, but FusionAuth has real insight into the actions. So FusionAuth knows what's a login request, what's a forgot password request, and your proxy isn't going to know some of that stuff. So basically what this lets you do is it lets you on a per user basis block requests when a certain number of failed requests have happened over a certain time period. So I am changing this to when a login fails and you have more than one login fail in 60 seconds, we're going to block all future login requests for that user until 60 seconds have passed without a failed login attempt. Let me repeat that. Because of these settings, if there's one failed login attempt, all future login attempts for that user will fail until 60 seconds have passed without any login attempt. I'm going to get an API key because I'm going to demo the login API, but the same rate limiting affects the hosted login pages or the OAuth login flow as well. So here I am logging into Nesh with his correct password. We have an authorization key because the login API by default requires an API key. We're setting the content type and we're calling against the slash API slash login endpoint. There is Dinesh, he's logged in. Awesome. Let's go ahead and say that someone is trying to log in to Dinesh's account and they are a bad actor. We can see that we get a 404 response here and that rate limiting has actually been triggered. So if we do this again, we're going to get another 404, another 404. And in this case, even if we try to log in with the correct password, we're still rate limited. So basically from the moment that wrong password is entered, there's in this particular case, a 60 second timeout and we have to wait until that has happened before any attempt by that user will work. Now Dinesh is still locked out right? because rate limiting is occurring for him but if we use someone else's account they're able to log in. So again it's a per user system so if we were going to wait for 60 seconds then Dinesh would be able to log in again. And there it is. So let's go look at the application. For applications, we have the same set of templates that we can configure. And the templates we configure at the application level will override the ones that we configure at the tenant level. So if we have an application and we want to set up a uh, password update warning that is specific to the application, we can do so.
we also can override the access control list so that for a given application, we can lock things down to the CEO's home IP if we want. We've looked at the application, we've looked at tenants, we've looked at webhooks, we've looked at API keys, and we've looked at the access control list creation. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions about the advanced threat detection feature or want to learn more about FusionAuth, please visit our website. Thanks.